you're the uh, the CEO of the Chicago Public School System, and uh, you've been instrumental in consolidating, shutting down schools, and uh, when you started down this path, there was an expectation that Chicago, which is a, known to be a pretty violent city anyway, that there was feeling that there was no way that you could do this. There was no way that you could surgically excise and shift people around without there being some uptick in violence, diminishment in achievement, and yet there hasn't been an uptick in violence and actually in achievement has that kind of improved. Um, how do you explain? How do you explain that it it worked out? Um. Well, in, in a very real sense, it's, it's something that I had spent 30 years of my life kind of doing. And so I didn't approach it as being impossible. Um, and we put together uh, a team, a cross-functional team of, uh, of people that could provide the necessary tools that would be needed in the schools. Um, to make sure that uh, we were able to accomplish what we set out to accomplish. Our goal was quite simple. Um, we wanted every child to feel welcome in their new school. Whether that child was in the school and there were new children coming to join them or if they were one of the new children coming to join a new school. Um, and so we laid the groundwork um, and provided some tools to enable that and also to create the expectation that this is what's going to happen. And so in macro, we close, we, we, our, our transition team, we touched 123 schools, 30,000 students. We spent $255 million in four months. Um, and knock on wood, no child has been injured going to or from school along our safe passage routes. Um, you know, we have another six weeks to go, but now we've gotten almost all the way through the year. And um, the performance in terms of discipline, in terms of attendance, in terms of grade point average, and in terms of uh, on-track measurement that we that we calculate has been either flat or slightly improving in the children that uh, were impacted in the closed schools, which is unheard of. Typically there's a cliff, fall off and then climb your way back. So basically what we did was we provided some tools. Uh, what, what would be an example of the tools? Um, we had a cultural integration plan where we would bring communities together from the schools, we had fairs, we had joint field trips, we had student ambassadors going to the other schools to introduce themselves. Um, um, we had uh, cook uh, uh, barbecues, um, and the basically our principals and teachers. Uh, well, throughout this, our principals and teachers carried the load, but we just basically put it in place so that we gave them some tools. We had a social and emotional learning. Uh, component where we provided programs to children, individuals, uh, to, to how to cope with change. Um, we added safe passage routes so that no child was out of the sight of an adult from the time that they started on the safe passage route until they got to school. Um, we were, um, uh, the, the, this was a citywide effort championed by the mayor and the school board and the CEO. We tore down houses, we mowed empty lots, we replaced concrete squares that were broken. We repainted crosswalks. We replaced thousands of lights. We added security cameras. Um, this was a city-wide effort and those were the kinds of tools that we deployed to make it successful. But at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, just like it is in combat, uh, where an individual combat soldier has got to execute a mission on the ground tactically, our teachers carried the load. 
all we did was give them some resources, but they were absolutely amazing. Uh, and uh, our principals and teachers were absolutely amazing. Um, didn't have to be that way. Um, but we all had a presumption of, you know, we're going to take care of the children. We're going to make them feel welcome on day one. Uh, how did the idea, let's make them feel, I mean, that's a beautiful vision. We're going to make every child feel welcome into school. How did that vision come um, it, 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 I said, I, don't, I, I think it was a uh, articulation of the obvious. You know, um, we sat down and said, well, you know, what do we want? We want, you know, all of these things. And I learned a long time ago in the, in the Pentagon that, you know, you've got to make it clear, succinct, and unassailable if you're going to have a vision that, that, makes a difference and that you can carry the activity on. So that was pretty clear and pretty unassailable, pretty succinct. Um, and everything leads to that end and everything we did led to that end. Do you remember a day when, when that succinct vision, that, that, that defining, this is what we're gonna do, do you remember the day when you say, we, this is what we're gonna, this is it? I just kind of started with that, it's almost immediately. Um, well, did you, were you the one who brought it up? Mm -hmm. Suggested. Yeah, that, that was. Uh, uh, it was just obvious to me that this is what we wanted to do. And and to be fair, I had 30 years of kind of getting ready for this, and you know, of the beneficiary of a couple of graduate degrees in related fields. So it's not something that, to me, was new or novel. Um, it was something that was going to be hard and challenging, but. Um, you know, was it any harder than some of the other kinds of things that we'd done or any grander than some of the other kinds of things that we had done um, in the military? And it, it, it was, it's certainly incredibly important and difficult, but there have been other important and difficult things that, you know, we've lived through, that I've lived through, that I brought to that experience. Um, when, when you uh, came up with that, do you remember the response. I mean, I mean, I mean, there is some real clean. That's a clean vision. I mean, do you, and I think the beauty of clean vision is, it's not only unassailable. It's it, it, it spontaneously enrolls people into. Yeah, that, that's what we're going to do. Do you do you remember that happening? Yeah, everybody smiled. Really? Yeah, everybody smiled, and I said, you know, this is our. This is what we're going to do. We're going to make every child feel welcome in their new environment. And our and our team color is coral. I don't know why I threw that in, but it seemed to work at the time. <laughs> um, um, Not green. Yeah, it wasn't green. Coral. I've gone gone over to the coral side. So, um, you know, it was it was a lot of hard work by people at the central office. But the, you know, the people in the headquarters, they can lose the war, but they can't win it. It's got to be the teachers on the ground. The ones that principals and teachers make all this stuff happen, and there's that smile when those new children show up in the classroom. Um, that's what makes all this happen, and that was a struggle that, you know, it's ongoing. It's a daily, it's a daily battle to focus on education in some of our neighborhoods. Um, probably in all of our neighborhoods, it's just a bigger battle in some than others. Um, it, it's, it's. It was a, it's also a testament to the communities. Though. I mean, we had 600 Safe Pages workers who signed up to be, a, uh, we paid them a little bit, but essentially they go out and spend two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon. It's their community that they're protecting. Um, and I think that it's helpful in that people in certain parts of Chicago are just fed up at this point with the violence and um, one it stopped more than ever before. Were there any incidents with that with that adult watching the safe passage? You know, would uh, sense a threat and they would intervene and they'd say, "Now uh, let them go off to school here." Oh, I'm sure it happens on a daily basis. The things that you don't hear about, you never get credit for the bullets that you dodge. Um, and I think that's what it's all about. And it happens every single day. And it's not just the safe passage workers, but we have uh, safe haven uh, vendors uh, in this, you know, over, um, where there's a safe haven sign on the door. And if a child feels uncomfortable, they know they can go through that door at that shop or that church or that library and, uh, and be safe. 
Um, I think you can get results with heartfelt leadership that are more sustainable and uh, and and larger, more uh, uh, better results. Quite frankly, um, it's it's is it is it you know it's hard to push people. It's easy for them to follow you, and it's harder to push them. So I mean, if if you consider the alternative, the alternative is not heartfelt leadership. The alternative is automatons and 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 and, and harsh decision making without regard or callous, without regard to the the impact on the individual. I, you're still going to make the hard decisions in heartfelt leadership. It's just that the, now it's the communication of the decision that's different, and the basis for the decision is different. I never. And I've certainly fired people, um, but the difference is I never wanted to fire anybody that wasn't convinced that they should probably be fired. Um, and if you've done your job communicating to them over time, whether they admit it or not in the moment, they know they're no longer a good fit for the organization. So it's not a surprise when you show up and say, you know, you're not a, we, going forward. We're going to have to make a change here. Um, but you've communicated that over time because you had compassion for this person and you wanted them to succeed. It's up to them whether they succeed or not. Not up to you. What's up to you is your desire, genuine desire for them to succeed. These are the people on your team. This is the hand you've been dealt. Let's play that hand in the best way possible. Um, and that, you know, uh, you can be as callous as you want, but the learning curve is a, is a problem, having everybody continuously in the learning curve. Um, having people that have been through the business cycle once, whatever that business cycle is, been through it the first time, because they get better the second time. You know, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, everything is going to happen. It's more anticipated, uh, you understand the rhythms. Um, there's a real negative to uh, kind of uncaring dismissiveness of the talent that uh, that surrounds you every day in a business activity. Um, and people have said over the years, and I believe it, you know, our most important assets ride up and down the elevators every day. Let's treat them like that. If you treat them like that, then you're consistent with heartfelt leadership.